Last week was a great time of worship together. Uh, amen. Yeah, if you missed it, I'm sorry, you missed it. Um, you'll have to catch it next time. It's uh, our, our Come Together service. We have all three of our English-speaking services and our Hispanic service all meet together at one time, and we worship in English and Spanish, and uh, I even uh, was told there were some other uh, languages present at the day, at the day and uh, it's just a great time. But that was just the beginning of our week. Then we had five more days after that of just, if y'all drove by here or stepped your foot inside, this entire campus was transformed by the Windshape team for our, uh, our Windshape camp for our young ones. Amen. And it was just a great week, fantastic. And then this morning, we, we <laughs> launched off a group of teenagers and chaperones to Warner Robins, Georgia for World Changers, where they're going to be... Um, helping out just with benevolent needs there in the area, painting houses, building wheelchair ramps, taking care of people's lawns, and uh, honoring the Lord and growing in Him this week. So y'all remember to pray for our world changers this week. Keep praying for all the kids and the adults that were here for Windshape this past week. And I got one more thing I want to point out. Might have already said it before, but I just want to stress, I know uh, Pastor Jeff actually mentioned it. Next Sunday uh, at 4.30, from 4.30 to 5.30, here at the church... We're going to be, you're going to be getting a recap of the Southern Baptist Convention that we went to in June. And <clears throat> I know it's hard, you know, once you kind of go home and get settled to come back up here, but I, I think it's worth it, especially if you're a member here at First Woodbridge. And this is the reason why we want to do this. First of all, because this church saw fit to send me and Pastor Jeff down to the Southern Baptist Convention this year, so we thought it would be only right that you get a, um, a report from kind of what's going on with our convention. But the second reason, and this is probably the more important reason, is that we want our church members to understand what it is we believe as a congregation. Um, some of the issues that get discussed at the, at the Southern Baptist Convention are things that really affect you as church members. So we want you to be informed where do we stand as a congregation? Uh, how do we address these issues? How do we address these issues with those outside of our congregation. So that'll be at 4.30 next week, and there'll be a time of question and answer, as long as your questions are easy to answer. <laughs> Just kidding, you can ask any question, and Pastor Jeff will answer the hard ones. <clears throat> Today's sermon is about sacrifice, and there is not a human being in here, there's not a human being alive that would not be alive today if someone had not sacrificed for you. Your parents sacrificed for you. They gave their time. They gave their money. They probably gave large parts of their sanity <laughs> for you. Um, teachers, I guarantee you, your teachers at some point sacrificed so that you could have an education. Um, coaches, mentors, neighbors, brothers and sisters, you even have, uh, as you grow older, maybe your adult children are sacrificing to help take care of you. Human beings were just, we were made, we, we literally cannot live without someone taking something that they have and giving it to you, right? That's what a sacrifice is. It, it's theirs, not yours. You need it. They give it to you. <clears throat> and they're sacrifices of all kinds, right? You can lend somebody a pencil in first grade, or you can invite a homeless person to come live with you. All kinds, all levels of sacrifices. Well, today we're going to talk about the ultimate and greatest sacrifice. And that is that God's Son, Jesus Christ, He took on human form, and He was crucified on the cross. And it wasn't to set an example it wasn't to say, this is what it looks like to truly care about other human beings. It was actually to pay for something that you and I couldn't pay for, and that's our own sins. Amen. And his sacrifice, not only is it the greatest sacrifice, because it's the only time God himself gave everything he could give. Actually, that's what all creation is, is God giving what he could give. But in his son, he gave all that he could give. But that's not just it. It's also what it means. It's the benefit of the sacrifice. And that is a life for those who belong and trust and receive the sacrifice. It's a life lived in fellowship with your Creator and then an eternity 
beyond in heaven with him. That's what we're looking at today. Y'all turn with me to Hebrews chapter 9. Thank you. If you're thinking of entering into ministry, get you a wife that knows where your tea is on the front, <laughs> the front row. <laughs> uh, I think my, my, my voice is a little, a little gone from this week, I guess. I don't know. So, Hebrews 9. <clears throat> what we're looking at today is an extension of what we looked at last week. Last week we saw Christ was a greater sanctuary. And in this great sanctuary, we see that um, <clears throat> it all took an initiation, an inauguration. It was the most precious uh, substance on the planet. Blood had to prepare the temple ornaments and the, and the tabernacle itself for God's worship. So it's out of this mindset that we come into this great sacrifice who is Christ. And kids in here... Let me tell you, we're going to go through about six points, but the last three points build on the first three points. So kids, this is what I want you to do. See if you can remember three reasons we need a sacrifice. Three reasons we need a sacrifice. Y'all can come up and tell me about it afterwards. But now before we get into God's word, before we start to read, let's go to the Lord together in prayer. God, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for all that you have given us. We thank you for bringing us back here in the same room to read your word, to sing your word, to pray your word, to preach your word, to live your word. God, none of us are sufficient for this task, but you are. And you work in your people so that your will would be done, and we are greatly satisfied in you. Please do these things among us and in us this day, and if anyone here does not know you, does not trust you as their great sacrifice. May you convict their hearts today. May they see the truth, and may they turn to you. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> All right, two big questions, and under the, the, each of these two questions are three points that are going to coincide with each other. It, it's, it's more simple than it sounds. All right, the first question is, why do we need a sacrifice? Why do we even need a sacrifice? You see, if you grew up in church... You've been told this ever since you were little, right? Jesus died for you. Jesus died for you. But sometimes we forget to ask, well, why? Why, did, why do we need this sacrifice? If God is God and he's in control of all things, why couldn't he forgive us without a sacrifice? And so this is the question that we're going to seek to answer. Um, as we look at God's design, you think about it. God created, he invented the universe, and he created it to operate in a certain way. And so as he created it to operate in this way, uh, there are certain truths that we grasp. And when it comes to sacrifice, the first truth that we see according to God's ordered universe is that an inheritance requires death. An inheritance requires death. Let's read and I'll show you what I'm talking about. In verse 16, for well, where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. Now, the will here is kind of like the last will and testament, all right? For a will takes effect only at death, since it is not in force, uh, in force as long as the one who made it is alive. <clears throat> this is exactly what we want. We want an inheritance. Remember back in verse 16? It says we received the promise of an eternal inheritance and we see at the end of chapter 2 that uh, Christ sent out his angels to serve for the sake of those who were going to inherit salvation. And the Apostle Paul in Ephesians says that it's the Holy Spirit who seals us for the day of our inheritance. That's what we want. I mean, that's our hope, is that we would receive something that we didn't have to work for, right? Something that we could never work for. That there would be a kingdom that we didn't build that we get a, to be a part of. That would be in our inheritance. And, and the author of Hebrews is using a common sense. It's common sense to us. I believe it was common sense to the early readers. And that is when you're dealing with an inheritance, when you're dealing with a last will and testament, so it's a statement, when I die, so-and-so gets this, so-and-so gets this. 
Well, that doesn't go into effect until that person dies. And, and y'all know this, right? Because once you get to a certain age, you start walking around your, your parents' house and you say, that's going to be mine. And that's going to be mine one day. You know, and I'm going I'm to let my, my sister have that one. Right? But it's not yours yet. You know, one day, and again, you know, we never want our parents to die, but we know it's going to, you know, it's not yours, but one day your parents will pass on and, and you'll inherit these things. We know that. And that's the point the author of Hebrews is making. That this inheritance cannot take place until someone dies. That's part of the way God has ordered things. So the second, that's the first reason. The second reason we need a sacrifice is that God's covenants, his promises, um, they require blood. All right, so his contracts with mankind, they require blood. Listen to this. Verse 18. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. It wasn't initiated, right? It didn't start without blood. For when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, this is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. And in the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tent and all the vessels used in worship. So you get this picture. Um, like we talked about last week, you've got the tabernacle and all the ornaments of the tabernacle. Well, you, they had to be made ready. They had to be made ready for worship. And the way they were to be made ready for worship is Moses was supposed to take this hyssop, little floppy plant, and dip it in blood and water and sprinkle everything with blood and water to, to show these are now suitable for use in God's worship. They are suitable for a, to be a part of of this covenant, this promise that God has made. And the whole reason for this blood was to show we're talking about a big deal here. It's to stress the seriousness of the situation. And, and this, again, this is a concept that you and I are very familiar with. We know how serious things are when blood gets involved. Like a little kid, when they're running on the on the playground and they fall down they skin their knee and they're perfectly fine until they look down and they see the blood right now it's a big deal and adults do the same thing when you're in the er right the emergency room and the dad sees a little bit of blood and he falls out now you have to get two nurses in there all right movies a movie might receive an r rating when it has too much blood in it because it's serious. When we're talking about something terrible in this world, what do we say? It's blood curdling. When two people are particular, cl particularly close to one another, we say they're like blood brothers. When somebody is really good at a sport, we say she has it in her blood, right? And if two people are at odds with each other, we say there's bad blood between them. And what is this? What is it about the blood? We understand completely what it is. Blood is life and death. And we talk about the blood flowing through your veins. We talk about being alive. We talk about the blood going out from someone's face. We say it's like part of them has been diminished. We say you, you have to be careful that you don't le lose too much blood. It's, it's, big it's a big deal. So what God is saying by using blood to inaugurate his covenants, to bring about his promises, he's saying my promises are a big deal. So y'all hear me on this, okay? Because what is it that God has promised? He has promised, like we saw a couple of weeks ago with the covenants, he has promised that a broken covenant means somebody has to be punished. So he's saying, it's a big deal. I will rain down my wrath upon someone by my blood. It's, it's like he's, it's like, you know, by blood. It's like he, he's, he's, he's invoking this uh, understand, our understanding of blood to help us to see what a big deal this is. And he's saying, my promises, my promises to you are that I love you. And if you trust in me, I will never leave you or forsake you. And I will bring you into heaven. By blood, I will bring you into heaven. By blood, I will forgive you. Amen. And he's saying, do you get it? That's how, that's how serious this is. This is God's promises. 
But forgiveness is costly. That's the third reason why we have to have a sacrifice. Forgiveness is costly. So in verse 22, Indeed, under the law, that's the Old Testament law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. There's no forgiveness without blood. And we say, okay, help us understand this, God. And we go all the way back to the beginning. As my, as my theologian wife likes to say, it all begins with Genesis. It all goes back to Genesis. So if you go all the way back to the beginning, and you see Adam and Eve in, pers- in perfect harmony with God himself in the garden. And to, to illustrate how perfect this harmony was, it says they were, they were naked and they were unashamed. And then when sin enters this world, what's one of the first things that happened? They hide from God, and it says they recognize their nakedness, and by implication it says they recognize their shame. They, they, they're, they're fearful before God. And we see, as that narrative plays out, something happens. Something happens in the vein of forgiveness. And in the first time in history, a death takes place. And whose hands does the death take place by? Do you all remember? It's God. God kills the first animal in history. And why does he do it? He is taking something that belongs to him and he's using it to cover the shame of Adam and Eve. Using it to cover their guilt. And now, that some people say, well, that may have implications as far as the, the sacrificial system that was to come later. Some people say it doesn't. But the, the basic idea is this, that we need to understand. Adam and Eve are the ones that sinned. God is the one that paid for it. You think about it. He made in six days all of creation. At the end of six days, he sat back and he said, I'm done. He said, I'm going to rest. I'm finished. You know why I'm going to rest? Why it's finished? Because I did it right. It's good. He says, in fact, it's very good. So everything that he made is very good, which means God had to take part of his own creation, his own very good design, and he had to kill it for the sake of Adam and Eve and their sin. It cost God something to forgive. We need to grasp that. I think God wants us to understand that. He wants us to understand that it costs. It's just like uh, if somebody steals $20 from you and goes and buys a sandwich. You can choose not to forgive that person, and you can follow them around until they finally give you the $20 back, and you can be bitter, bitter and spiteful against them. Or you can forgive them And guess what it's going to cost you? $20, right? There is no forgiveness without cost. Anytime you forgive a person, it is going to cost you something. If somebody slanders you, if somebody talks bad about you or is rude to you, you can refuse to forgive them and you can try to talk bad back against them. You can try to slander them back or you can just hold this grudge against them for however long you want to or you can forgive them and it's going to cost you. It's going to mean that you don't get revenge on what they did. It's going to mean that you don't walk around holding a grudge against these people. It costs you. Now, these are little things. I mean, what does it cost to forgive something like arson? Somebody sets your house on fire. What if somebody steals a million dollars? How much does it cost to forgive that person? What if somebody commits murder? How much does it cost to forgive? You know how much it costs God to forgive you and to forgive me John 3 16 tells us for God so loved the world that he gave what his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but shall have eternal life that's the cost of God's forgiveness the most precious uh substance the most precious being imaginable Jesus Christ God in the flesh slain for the sins of the world that's what forgiveness costs and that's why we need a sacrifice right so you get the idea you can't have an inheritance until somebody dies god's promises require blood and sacrifice is costly 
That's why we need a sacrifice. But why do we have to have Jesus' sacrifice? Why does it have to be him? Y'all ever think about that? Like, God, what's going on? Why, why, why couldn't you just be satisfied with the blood of the calves and the goats? And here's why. So you'll notice how these match up. So <clears throat> inheritance requires a death. Heavenly inheritance requires divine death. If you want to inherit the heaven, right? If you want to inherit God's dwelling place, then God has to die. Amen. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, dying on a cross. It had to happen. Verse 23. Thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. So what we're seeing here is called an a priori argument. It's from the lesser to the greater. This small thing had to be done, so how much more this greater thing, right? These earthly ornaments, this earthly tabernacle had to be purified with blood. So if these things had to be purified with the blood of bulls and calves or calves and goats, then how much greater does, the heaven, does heaven need to be prepared with what kind of sacrifice? Has to be the sacrifice of Christ. Now understand this. Because there's a question embedded in here. What in the world are the heavenly things? What things need to be purified before they can be in heaven? Well, it's not God. It's not Jesus. Some people disagree about this, but I'd say it's probably not heaven itself. Y'all remember last week? We talked about Christ being the greater sanctuary. And ultimately, who are the ornaments of the sanctuary? The ornaments of the sanctuary are prepared for earthly worship and we saw that through Christ he makes his church he makes you into the ornaments of the sanctuary so guess who is getting prepared for the heavenly places it's you right so the table with the showbread for example had to be cleansed by the blood of calves and goats so that it could be uh, worthy to be there in the temple well you have to be cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ so that you can go into your heavenly inheritance it's good, y'all. It's good. Look, when the Wootens move, we have furniture that has to go from one house to another house, from Alabama to Virginia, and some of that furniture has been sitting in the same place for a little while, so we got to prepare it, right? We have to dust it off. There might be some screws that need to be tightened. We might need to paint it for the new place. You have to prepare the old furniture for its new dwelling, and that's exactly, listen to me, y'all, that's exactly what Christ has done for you through his sacrifice. He's taking your, your busted up body and soul, cleansing it with the most precious substance in all the universe, which is the blood of Jesus himself, and making you ready for your eternal inheritance in heaven. Amen. That's good, because I know, I know some of y'all know what y'all were up to this week or last week or two years ago or ten years ago. You know that you've got some screws loose, and you know that you can use another coat of paint. God's got it taken care of, right? Wash with the blood of Jesus. So if God's covenants require blood, then Christ's covenant requires his own blood. His own blood. Excuse me, y'all. Look at verse 24. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, right, which are copies of the true things, that's the, the tabernacle and its ornaments, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf, nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own, right? So the high priest had to go in every year offering the blood of goats and calves, right, over and over and over. For verse 26, for then he would have had to suffer repeatedly, Jesus would have, since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. We are in the end of the ages right now. Ever since Jesus, ever since the incarnation, since Jesus came to earth, he ushered in, it's called inaugurated, I'm sorry, I use big, big words sometimes, uh, I think it's good for us to grow our spiritual vocabulary. Inaugurated eschatology, when Jesus came, it began the end times, 
So we were in the end times. We are in the end times. We're going to be in the end times for however long until Jesus comes back. And the mark of the end times is that the once for all sacrifice has already been offered. Amen. It's not the blood of calves and goats. It's the blood of Jesus Christ. One time, the, the, the priests, they had to always offer it, right? They were trying to take care of the sins of the people around them while also trying to take care of their own sins. But Jesus says, I've got enough for everybody, and I'll just have to do it once. Right? That's why when you look back at verse 20, it says, Moses, as he was preparing the, in the instruments for the temple, he would say, sprinkling with the blood, he'd say, this is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. But we know what Jesus said in Luke 20, right? What did he say about the blood of the Lord's Supper, or the, the cup of the Lord's Supper? This is my blood of the new covenant. That's why Jesus, when he hung on the cross, he said, it is finished. It's done one time. Amen. It's, like those, uh, it's like those Roomba vacuum cleaners. You just hit the button and they, it cleans your floor for all eternity, right? We don't have one. I guess that's how they work. They just roll around your house cleaning up. You don't ever have to vacuum again. It's perpetual motion of forgiveness in Christ. He did it once. He took care of it forever. Forever. Your sins are taken care of forever. <clears throat> and then we see as forgiveness is costly, well, Jesus paid, right? He paid the whole cost. Forgiveness has been paid. We sang in the first service, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin has left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. He paid it, he paid it. So when we're looking at this, yes, we need to be cleansed, yes, we need to be made ready for heaven, but it's not just that we have to be cleansed and cleaned up for heaven, it's that he actually had to pay for your sins, right? You are guilty and somebody had to pay that guilt and it was Christ who took your place and paid the guilt for you. He paid for it. He paid the cost of forgiveness. So uh, back to verse 27. We're going to read 27 and 28. And just as, is an appoint, as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes the judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. I want you to notice the logic. Amen. I want you to notice the logic there in verses 27 and 28. It's appointed for man to die once, and after that comes the judgment. That is the pattern of history, okay? That's part of, that's part of what makes you up. When you are born, you have a, I use this word sparingly, but you have a destiny. And your destiny is this, you're going to die, okay? And your destiny is this, then you are going to be judged by Almighty God. All right? That's, that's guaranteed for you. When you are born, death and judgment. Unless, unless something breaks that pattern. And that's exactly what the author of Hebrews says. Christ, instead of dying like everybody else dies, he was offered. So we all die once, Jesus was offered once. And his offering was not for the sake of judgment, his offering is so that he will appear a second time, not to judge, but to do what? To save. Do you see that? To save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Who are the ones that are eagerly waiting for him? It's his church. That's, that's right. It's us. It's Christians. And so what we break the pattern because of what Christ has done. Hear me, church. Your pattern is not to die once and to be judged. Your pattern is to die once just like every person is going to die, right? Jesus talks about that in John 11. But he says, whoever believes in me, though he dies, yet he lives. Amen. So your death does not bring about a judgment for you. Your, breath, your death will bring about salvation for you. And Jesus one day will return and he will gather his church to himself and we will all be with him in heaven because of his work, because of his sacrifice. Amen. Let me share this with you. Uh, Matthew 26. Jesus, as he's given the Lord's Supper, he says, this is my bread broken for you. This is the cup spilled for you at the cup of the new covenant, my blood. 
And if you were a Jewish person, you would pick up on this, but you can pick up on this just if you, if you really read the text carefully. The Lord's Supper, the, 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 the Passover that they would have known it as, it's left unfinished. There's an ellipsis. There's a dot, dot, dot. And this is it. And Jesus says, I will not have this supper with you again until you see me in heaven. So he starts the Lord's Supper, and then it's on pause. On pause until when? Until we get to the end in Revelation chapter 19. Let me read this to you. John, as he got a glimpse of heaven, saw this. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out. Which, by the way, that's what we're practicing for on Sunday mornings when we sing. All right, we're just getting our voices warmed up. Hallelujah, for the Lord of God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It, is, it was granted her, the bride is the church, the church of Jesus Christ, by the way. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this. Blessed are those who were invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. In other words, God on blood is saying, we're going to finish this supper together. Because of the sacrifice of Christ, we eagerly wait and sometimes our bodies burn and sometimes our soul cries out and screams and we say God how long how long oh Lord and he says not long keep waiting it's going to happen we're going to be together so this is why we need a sacrifice and this is why only the sacrifice of Christ will do we are fortunate here in northern Virginia and that we get the opportunity to engage with people from all over the world all kinds of religions all kinds of worldviews all kinds of uh, humanistic ideologies and we can look each one of these people in the face and say you don't have a sacrifice like Christ who is going to pay the price for your sins and we can say let me show you the greater sacrifice Now, there's, there's, a, there's a payoff here at the end of the sermon. Sometimes I tell you what the payoff is at the beginning. Sometimes I dole it out a little bit as we go along. This time you had to wait until the end, so I thank you for your patience. Here it is. Jesus is the greater sacrifice, so stop trying to pay for your sins. All right, it's like that, it's like that skit I forget where it comes from. Stop it. Just stop it. Right? Stop trying to pay for your sins. Now, let me show you what I'm talking about. So in, in chapter 10, verses 1 through 4, I'll explain this to you. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered year by year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, they would not have ceased to be offered, right? We don't do the sacrifices anymore. We don't have the temple anymore. Since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins. But in these sacrifices, there's a reminder of sins every year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Let me remind you what I've reminded you over and over and over through this sermon series is that the people that are being written to in the book of Hebrews. These are new Christians coming out of a Jewish background. They recognize at this point being a Christian is hard. The world around us puts pressure on us. We're being persecuted. We're being tempted to turn away from Christianity. And it sure was a lot easier when we were just Jews. And so they're saying, maybe we'll go back to some of the Jewish customs. Maybe we'll go back to the Old Testament sacrificial system. Maybe there's another sacrifice that we can offer that'll do for us what Christ did. And the author of Hebrews is saying the same thing over and over and over and over. You don't want to go back. 
There's nothing back there for you. And that is exactly the message for you and you and you and you and you and you and me and all of us today. And that is Christ's sacrifice has done all that you need. Stop trying to pay for your own sins. And there's some people in here that you are racked with guilt and you know what you've done and you know where you've been in your life and and maybe it's even a place that you've been this past week or even last night or whatever it is and you feel like you must somehow pay for what you've done you must somehow make it right and yes there's a time and there's a place to to talk about restitution on this earth and there and certainly there's a time and a place to talk about holy living which is a different sermon for a different day, but before you get to any of that, you've got to recognize that you carrying that guilt around is doing nothing to pay for your salvation. Put it down. Stop it. Some of you in here think that you can achieve and you can climb the ladder and you can rank up and you can get promotions and you can have the nice looking family and you can have the nice house and you can do everything that is called successful in this world and that way you will pay for what you failed to do before stop you are not going to validate your existence in that way some of you are puffed up with pride and you think if I can just stand up straight enough if I can speak well enough if I can wear the right clothes, if I can just get people to see that I'm not that bad of a guy, I'm not that bad of a girl, then somehow that will pay for the fact that I know I really am that bad. Stop it. All that, your guilt, your achievement, your pride, it's the blood of calves and goats. It's not going to pay for your sins. There's one sacrifice. It's Jesus Christ. So this is all you have to do. And I've said this many times in this series. It's it's so simple, you're going to think I'm making it up. You're going to think I'm lying to you. All you have to do is humble yourself before God. All you have to do is hit your knees and say, your will be done. Not my will, your will be done. Not my work, your work. Not my sacrifice, your sacrifice. And you don't have to pay for it, and you don't have to earn it. You don't have to bargain for it. You don't have to say, God, if you will give me this, then I will dedicate my life to blank, 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 blank. You don't have to do any of that. You just have to recognize who Jesus is and fall down on your face before him and say, praise God, forgive me. And you see this. You see a picture of this in Luke 18. In the, in the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector where Jesus sees the Pharisee and he walks into the temple and this is exactly what he's doing. He's got his shoulders back, he's got his chest puffed out, he's got his chin up and he's saying, and, and remember where he is, he's gone into the temple which means he's there to worship God. And before God Almighty, he is trying to plead his case. He is trying to show, I fast twice a week, I give tithes at all, of all I get. He's trying to say, God, see the sacrifices that I have made. And then there's the tax collector who won't even lift his eyes to heaven, but he beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus says, I tell you this, the man went away, the tax collector went away to his house justified rather than the other, the Pharisee. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. So what do you do? You fall down on your knees. And let me tell you something. This is a one-time thing where you go from I used to ignore Christ, I used to try to pay for my own sins, and now for the first time in my life, I am recognizing that his sacrifice is sufficient. And you cry out and you say, God, have mercy on me. Save me from my sins. And Jesus says, you will be justified. It's trusting that Jesus is everything he said he was and that his sacrifice will cover you completely. And that's a one-time thing. But guess what? And here's the good news, y'all. This is what's so awesome. Look, I just, let me just talk with y'all about this. The gospel is not just for the lost. As a Christian, 
the world is going to come back on you. And you're going to remember things that you did that you feel terrible about. And you feel shameful about. And as a Christian, you're going you're to get worn out one day. And you're going to realize you've been trying so hard. You've been trying so hard to justify your existence. And you've been trying so hard to say, See, God, see, I'm not wasting what you did for me in Jesus. And you're going to feel worn out. And as a Christian, sometimes you're going you're gonna to look at the people next to you that aren't doing as well as you are spiritually or emotionally or physically and you're going to start to get proud but as a christian listen the gospel message is this all you have to do is return to christ and bow down to him on your knees and just say your blood is sufficient amen i don't have to do i don't have to be i don't have to go except for what you tell me And you praise him and you take your mind off the world and you put your mind on heaven and you eagerly await the salvation of Jesus Christ. Isn't that good news? Amen. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we thank you. And we come to you, Lord, just humble. humble for the sacrifice that you provided and as we look out into the world and we look at all the ways that we try to make it right and we recognize you've already done it and so we don't have to return to the blood of calves and bulls and goats because we have the blood of Jesus Christ Lord, let us be humble before you. And as we surrender to you, and as we unload the burden, the burden of self-righteous living, the burden of trying to be and to impress in this world, we feel the weight lifted off of us. And we see that it is your hands that is removing that weight. And we trust in you, God. We trust in your sacrifice. Now we pray that you would strengthen us to go forth and proclaim this message to the world with everyone who is busy trying to save themselves and we can tell them there is a greater sacrifice in the name of Jesus.